This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Roots and All. This week, I'm speaking to landscape architect Sally Bauer. Sally has just been awarded the main RHS prize for her bursary report, titled Nature Rising from the Rubble, which looks at gravel and recycled aggregate gardens in Essex and London. Specifically, Sally looked at John Little's Hilldrop Garden, RHS Hyde Hall, Beth Chateau's Gravel Garden, the Langdon Nature Discovery Car Park and the Horniman Museum Grasslands Garden. And her findings were invaluable if you're interested in designing with or growing in these types of media. And Sally has some surprise findings of note too. She begins by talking about her professional background. So yeah, I'm a landscape architect and garden designer and I've been doing that for the last couple of decades. I retrained at the beginning of this century at Sheffield University as a landscape architect. And then I worked in a really big practice in Manchester for, I think it was about 12 years. And then the last eight or so years, I've been a sole practitioner in Liverpool, doing a sort of mixture of commercial work and domestic gardens. Before I was doing landscape, in the world of landscape, I was doing research in mathematics, sort of modelling volcanic eruptions. So quite a shift, but still interested in the landscape ultimately. Obviously your work is really varied, but the one thing I thought would be really good to talk to you about today was a study that you have done and I think you've got funding to do. And I wondered if you could just talk about the purposes of that study and then we'll kind of dig into it, what your findings were as we go along. So it was October last year, I got an RHS bursary travel grant to go and visit a number of gardens. I visited four gardens and a car park in Essex and London. And the reason I chose these was because they all use gravel or recycled waste as a growing media or a mulch. And it just really interested me how they were using those in terms of they were all aiming to be more sustainable and in some cases push it further for biodiversity and the the distinction between the gardens relates to the depth of the gravel or recycled aggregates so the first two gardens I went to both use a gravel layer as a decorative mulch and that was Beth Chateau's gravel garden and also the dry garden at Hyde Hall and they're not strictly no or low maintenance they're more about actually demonstrating what's possible without irrigating so using the right plants in the soil that they've got with a thin layer of gravel on top but never watering it once it's established in fact best chateaus they don't water it after they've planted things and then the other three gardens i went to are growing plants in much thicker layers of gravel or recycled waste and the advantage of that is that it's if done right, relatively low maintenance. You've got the benefits of it being weed seed free. It's thick enough to suppress the weeds beneath. It's a fairly low fertility, so it's a stressed environment for the plants so that you don't have this really competitive flourishing planting. So it could be a real positive benefit for schemes where you just haven't got the maintenance available. The first one, I went to was the Grasslands Garden at the Horniman Museum in London and that just uses a thick layer of pea gravel, 100 mil layer of pea gravel and the benefit of that it's very low maintenance and the planting was designed by James Hitchmout and I think it, it won lots of awards when it was completed, it's a stunning scheme and then the other two both by John Little, I visited his garden at Hilldrop And then a nearby car park that he's completed in the last couple of years at a wildlife centre. And they're both in Essex and they both follow similar principles. They both use a variety of different recycled aggregates, but all fairly thick and then sow sort of wildflower seeds on top. Um, I think the thing that I thought was really fantastic about this was actually that not only was it low maintenance, but he also designs for wildlife habitats into his schemes which really has a kind of dual benefit and takes it further. When I read your report I was struck by my own 
ignorance and also then I found myself yeah. wondering if other people had thought the same but when you talked about particularly Beth Chateau's garden you mentioned that when new beds are installed or refreshed those beds are subject to double digging and they get yes. mushroom compost incorporated to improve soil fertility and I wondered for me a that's not my understanding of a gravel garden and I wonder how many people are kind of laboring under that misapprehension and b how does that gel with the idea that plants grow really well in low fertility well-drained gravel substrates it just didn't make a lot of sense to me as I perceive a gravel garden what were your thoughts on yes. that I totally agree and I think it's a really good question it's I was surprised I still wonder whether it's completely necessary. I think it's come from a tradition of that's how you cultivate the ground when you prepare it. And I'd also say, is it totally appropriate? You know, using mushroom compost, often mushroom compost contains peat, which we shouldn't really be using at all. And how does the double digging impact the microsiral flora that's there? The only thing I'd say in the context of the gravel garden at Best Chateaus is that the native soil is extremely low fertility. It's a kind of gravelly, sandy sort of ballast, so it's, it has very little organic matter. So adding a small amount can, if you like, kickstart the growth so that you've got the right balance of stress to growth and would retain some moisture with the very low rainfall. And I think in parallel with that, there's been some really interesting studies by Katrin Schmidt in Germany, where he found that engineered soils with 10% compost and 90% aggregates gave an optimum growth. So there was enough stress to keep the maintenance low enough, but you still have enough growth. So I think that's where it sort of still works with Best Chateau's gravel garden. But I think even they probably are now exploring approaching it in different ways they've got deep core sand beds that they're experimenting with which have no compost added so I think it's a it's an evolving process to pick up on something else that you mentioned when you were answering the first question you yeah. mentioned about the weeds coming through and you visited the big sky meadow and then I think you found that covid related staffing issues had meant that it, it was getting weedy and another question that I had was that this type of planting is often sold as kind of a large scale solution to maintenance problems in public areas. Yet with these things, particularly the Big Sky Meadow now in its kind of seventh year of existence, I wonder how much these plant communities have evolved to be self-managing. You know, do you think that although these are sold as a low maintenance option, sometimes the maintenance can be as labour intensive as, say, a traditional flower border could be? I think no garden is or no landscape is completely no maintenance and it's a kind of misconception isn't it almost I think there is knowledgeable maintenance and that has to happen in any of these schemes but I think if I go through what I understand might have gone wrong with Big Sky Meadow which sort of half explains it Big Sky Meadow is at RHS Hyde Hall and it was perennial seeding onto coarse sand 100 millimeter thick coarse sand and the plant communities were designed by James Hitchmell. I don't know the whole history but I am aware that during Covid they missed key windows where they needed to do a small amount of knowledgeable weeding so you get airborne weeds coming in like goat willow and if you weed that when it's really small then you haven't got a problem but if that is allowed to establish it escalates into something that is unmanageable in a way that it is now. And the other issue, which actually James Hitchmore talks about in his book, Sowing Beauty, is that they had grass paths running through, which of course the grass continually tries to invade into the planting scheme. So you need to manage that all the time. So there's the choices that you need to make at the design stage, which will imply how much more maintenance you might need. But at the same time, you have to be doing something in key points during the establishment. And I think with the Big Sky Meadow, they obviously, for whatever reason, actually miss those windows so that it does now become much more labour intensive. If treated right, I think like in Germany, they used this approach really, really successfully. And it is low maintenance, much lower maintenance compared to a traditional flower board might be. So thinking about John Little's gardens that you looked yeah. at, Hilldrop and the car park garden that he did, particularly in his private garden, 
I wonder what the elements were that you found in the garden and how they work to encourage biodiversity, because that's obviously a big part of John's work. What did you find was particularly effective in that respect? Yeah, I mean, Hilltop is an absolutely amazing place to visit, and I'd recommend everyone goes there just to see what's possible. He's constantly experimenting. There's brownfield gardens, but there are also like three ponds, scrub, hedges, compost, dead hedges. But the key thing about, I think, his gardens is that they're inspired by abandoned landscapes. I mean, they're described as open mosaic habitats, which have been found to be fantastic for wildlife. So he's taken elements from that and then designed them integrably into his brownfield gardens. And there are three aspects that John talks about when he's designing this kind of landscape. The first one is that you need a variety of recycled materials as growing medium. So, you know, you use as dog sand, you can use crushed demolition waste, you can use all sorts of things, all intermixed in different ribbons together to create a kind of complexity that you need so that you get a complexity within the wildflower plantings. And then the second one is a varied topography. And that's kind of like a, almost like a micro topography that creates a lot more surfaces, a lot more changes in microclimates. Coupled with that, you need a varied depth of materials. So there's a, there's a real degree of complexity throughout the whole garden. But I think the key thing, which I think a lot of designers miss, is the third point, which is what John calls structural diversity. And it's about building habitats into the structural elements that we have in gardens. So it's about adding porosity, if you like. We're really good at providing food for pollinators, but we're less good at providing habitats for those pollinators and other invertebrates and wildlife to live. So as part of his gardens has things like gabions, log piles, dead wood, bee posts with holes in for solitary bees, and so I think it's those three key aspects which are components that actually make the difference in terms of biodiversity. So it's lots of different recycled materials as a growing media, varied topography and structural diversity. Yeah, his garden is absolutely amazing. And like you say, I would encourage people to visit if they can. You wrote about that garden, and I'm quoting here. You say, lessons to be gained from his garden are more about approach than creating a universal specification. And that really struck a chord with me because I do sometimes see that the way we try to find a technique and then apply it everywhere can be actually quite damaging in environmental terms. And I wondered how important you feel it is to have a site-specific approach to gardens and the design and the maintenance. I think it's really important. I agree completely. In a way, we've come from this position where we're saying we must have topsoil everywhere and we're challenging that and we should keep challenging and thinking about the way we do things. And John's approach is not a one size fits all application. I think it's about principles rather than technique. It's about understanding what the site's got, what's available locally being sensitive to the heritage, thinking about what the local community, how they're going to engage with it. And what's the purpose of the landscape? You know, it's, it's, it's not appropriate if it's going to be an orchard or other edible elements to use these materials. So I think you do have to really think about it as a site-specific design, you know, when you're designing. And one key thing is that John, he uses locally sourced materials. He uses thanate sand, which is really, really good for ground nesting bees, but that's really only available in the south. So I wouldn't propose to use it in Liverpool, whereas locally here, we use a lot of Mersey grit. It's what Richard Scott uses on many of his wildflower schemes, but you wouldn't specify Mersey grit in London, if that makes sense. So it's, it's about understanding all the complex elements, as you would do with any design, really. Definitely. I'm paraphrasing you, but I guess all gravel gardens are not created equally. But if they are well done, how much of a positive environmental contribution can these types of gardens make? I think it's huge. I mean, obviously, the benefits are you, you don't need to irrigate it. It's self-sustaining, but also it can sequester carbon if you use the right materials. So you don't need to maintain as much. There's a lot of potential there, but also 
if you're going to be positive about the contribution, it's about using materials that may be a waste normally and actually building them in a positive way into the landscape. So if you can, it's much better to use locally sourced demolition waste and industrial waste rather than raw materials like pea gravel. One of the things that I found surprising as well was that soil which contains demolition waste, which is high in lime, actually captures carbon more quickly. How does that work? I mean, it's something I'd love to know a bit more about, to be honest. I've heard John Little talking about it. Um, there's some research that's been done at Newcastle University, and there's quite a good article by Mike Goddard about it, where they basically monitored the amount of carbon that was sequestered in a brownfield site. But as far as I understand, the crushed concrete and lime that's in the demolition waste is really, really high in calcium, which very rapidly sequesters the atmospheric carbon dioxide and that forms calcium carbonate. I mean, we're all aware that there's organic soil carbon, but in this case, it's actually creating a form of inorganic soil carbon, which is stable. So, I mean, I I can't remember the figures, but potentially it's got a huge scope for sequestering carbon in these situations. I say something that would be really worth looking into further. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. And I suppose yeah. in terms of, I guess, all round performance, so both as an attractive space and a space that's good for biodiversity and providing habitat, what would be your favourite garden that you'd looked at out of all of them? It's a good question. I mean, I found it good comparing them all together and I learned a lot more comparing them together, I think. But probably... The best one for me was John Little's. I just felt that it was a really optimistic example of what's possible. It encourages us to think creatively and experiment through observing wildlife habitats that work. And it made me really question even whether I was asking the right questions, as well as being a beautiful garden. But it takes things in a different way from all the other gardens, partly because its goal is dual in that it is aiming to support wildlife just as much as it is to create a place for people so i mean i think it's an inspiring approach that we could all learn lessons from thank you to sally for writing the report and for talking to us about her research i was really pleased to get sally on the podcast as she suggested some excellent previous guests and is a great supporter of the show i met her in person for the first time last summer and we found out that we have a lot in common including the fact that we grew up in the same road and didn't even know it. Thanks to you for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a bug that might just be taking refuge in your home right now. Throughout the winter, it's quite likely that we'll have been sharing our homes with some of the creatures that normally reside outdoors, keeping them protected from freezing temperatures until spring, when these usually uninvited visitors will leave and return to the garden. And while some might have tucked themselves away individually within a nook or a cranny, others will have congregated together in groups. Often a little cluster that'll probably go unnoticed amongst the rafters in the loft. But sometimes, in very large groups of potentially many thousand individuals. And one species that this could relate to is Harmonia axiridis the harlequin ladybird. A ladybird that's been known to enter houses to overwinter in such large numbers that it becomes a nuisance, particularly when they're disturbed and defensively ooze a yellow, foul-smelling liquid from their joints. First appearing in Britain during 2004, probably on imported plant material, this invasive species from Asia with its many different colours and patterns, soon became headline news. Where initially we were being informed that the harlequin was a menacing, voracious predator that could potentially decimate our native insect populations. Then later, that sexually transmitted disease-carrying harlequins were invading our homes. In truth, though, The harlequin ladybird is indeed a voracious predator, but primarily of aphids, where, 
Around the world, it was already used commercially to control aphids on crops. But just like some of our native ladybirds, it would also eat other insects and even resort to cannibalism when aphids were no longer present. And as for sexually transmitted diseases, it had been known for over a hundred years that ladybirds could suffer from an ectoparasitic fungus called Laboule benialis, which, harmless to humans and other creatures, could spread from one ladybird to another when their bodies touched, such as when they mate. And anyone who has observed harlequin ladybirds will know that they do a lot of mating, and in a very comical way. However, since the invasion of harlequins almost 20 years ago, they become Britain's most commonly found ladybird and are now here to stay. Where they and their black dragon-shaped larvae with two orange stripes will be helping to control aphid infestations naturally throughout our gardens, particularly those aphids that curl the leaves of fruit trees and those that infest mature trees such as sycamore and beech. And so, instead of becoming a problem to Britain's biodiversity, the harlequins have, over time, become an important part of it and will undoubtedly help in reducing the use of insecticides. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast. 